Hello and welcome to another episode of B&B War Stories. I'm your host, Nick Laidlaw. Today we've got a story from a Ukrainian soldier named Yura. He will describe for us a very intense bombardment on his frontline position in the trenches of eastern Ukraine. He will also tell us what it's like to have the psychological effects of losing a comrade during one of these bombardments and evacuating his deceased body from no man's land back to the trenches. I will be describing scenes that are quite gory and graphic, so please watch this at your own discretion. As the night was passing, there were still a few hours left for sleep. The Russians, however, had other plans and began an assault. The shelling of our positions began, and the variety of calibers and types of weapons that flew in our direction was growing all the time. It was very loud. At some time, we heard on the radio that a vehicle was coming toward us. Four tanks and four infantry fighting vehicles. Splitting up, they attacked two positions directly in front of us. The cannonade did not stop. The armor was merely added to the artillery. Machine guns and tanks fired for suppression. Bullets began whistling over our hole. The command to prepare an RPG came to the radio. The enemy equipment was already close. As soon as everyone started to climb towards the loopholes, a new team arrived with RPGs. Immediately taking cover, the enemy shelling began again. After a couple of seconds, everything around us began to explode. The ground shook as the rockets fell closer to the hole, and sand poured on us. Immediately behind the rockets, the artillery began to dismantle our position bit by bit. They were very targeted and accurate. Almost all of them hit the position. A 152 caliber battery was most likely working on us, with no break of more than 30 seconds between shots for an hour. When the shells fell very close to us, the explosive wave hit our legs. The matted blanket that covered our hole was torn to pieces. We were covered with Donbass soil and the smell of blood. That familiar feeling from childhood, when you hit your nose hard, the blood has not yet had time to leave, but you can already smell it. Every time you hear that shrill whistle again before a blow, you instinctively cover your face and head with your hands, although you understand that in the case of a direct hit, it won't help. Black thick dust filled everything around us, making it very difficult to breathe. Ничего не видно. А? Не видно ничего. Ну, походу, блядь, по этому, блядь, по полю накидывают, блядь, с телефончика, что откуда бэха работает. Слышишь, а ты не помнишь, где ты сладкую воду поставил? А там где-то по сути должна быть. Справа, слева. Под стеночкой, под саночкой такая, блядь. Трехлитровая. After the first close hit, a radio was knocked out by the shock wave. It just started beeping. Fortunately, reloading new batteries helped. 
We stayed in touch and learned from messages that most of the enemy equipment had already been blown up by mines or destroyed by our artillery. Their infantry did not even have time to land, because the enemy began to retreat with great losses. Probably, because of this, they continued to cover us even harder and more precisely with artillery. Between one of the explosions, my friend Igor and another guy ran into a hole. They were hidden in the distance and did not know what was happening due to a lack of a walkie-talkie. We brought them up to speed and moved a little so they could fit completely in our temporary shelter. After a couple of very focused salvos, we heard almost a breathless scream on the radio. The boys from the neighboring hole reported that they were buried after a direct hit. Fortunately, almost immediately, they managed to dig out and climb into a small hole left at the entrance and crawl into another shelter. Later, they said that they saw sparks, and at that same moment, they were covered with earth up to their necks. All of them received cartusions and traumatic brain injuries, but we can still say that we were very lucky. The shelling continued for some time. It is difficult to say exactly. Our heads started to hurt. We had no thoughts. We just hear the whistles and squeeze into a ball and wait for our fates. Our nervous system was in a mode of maximum tension at that time, and it took a lot of strength. I wanted to sleep, but in such conditions, it was impossible. At one point, there was a long silence. For some time, we remained in our hiding places, listening to the sounds from outside. Sometimes something else flew in, an 80 caliber mortar or an SPG rocket. But these were smaller calibers, and no one paid attention to it. Against the background of what just happened to us, these explosions seemed like children's fireworks. Later, we hear a shout from one of the boys, whose hole was near our entrance. They said that they had a 200, a killed in action. While we were hiding, one guy left our dugout to look for a replacement for our walkie-talkie, but unfortunately, he found more than just the radio. About five meters from our exit, through which he tried to get out earlier, a partially burned and mutilated body was laying on the field. This was not the enemy, but our boy. It was clear from the uniform. The artillery before the morning assault began immediately after we were told about it on the radio. Everyone jumped into the nearest holes, and there was no way to find out who was where. Because of this, the absence of one soldier was not immediately noticed. Judging by what I saw, he just didn't have time to hide. The projectile hit him directly, somewhere in the knee area. Only his feet in boots remained in the trench. Another part of his body was thrown out of the trench about five meters. Most likely, looking at the damage, death came instantly, and he did not suffer. Though, next to the boots, later, I dug up a machine gun broken in half and pierced by fragments of artillery, and an RPG-7. Apparently, before his death, he took a position with a grenade launcher near the exit of our bunker to meet the enemy vehicles. It is strange that right before that, I was running to the shelter. I did not notice these boots with the feet in the middle of the walkway. Perhaps my brain was not ready to see this and simply ignored this discovery. I returned to the boys in the hole and told them what I had seen. Everyone was running out of adrenaline that the body had injected into their blood, and our heads began to ache. Strong, psychological, and physical fatigue set in. I wanted to sleep. My brothers decided to take a nap. Since I couldn't fall asleep in such an atmosphere, I just sat by the entrance of the dugout and listened to the radio and followed what was happening around us. I analyzed everything that had just happened and went through the options of how it could all end. I thought a lot about the deceased soldier. We did not know each other. I didn't even see his face. I only heard his tired voice when the other boys talked to him. He returned to his position after dark and almost immediately went to rest. And in the morning, we were in different parts of the position, so we didn't even cross paths. I sat and remembered an acquaintance who died in Mariupol, whose body could still not be returned home and properly buried and many other situations with people that I knew. This is a great grief and suffering for relatives, and it also gives a vain hope that some mistake has happened 
and the person is actually alive. And such thoughts can drive you crazy. All soldiers must return home, dead or alive. I decided that I had to climb up and drag the deceased into the trench, so that later it would be possible to evacuate him. While I was thinking about this, Igor woke up and offered to help me, and we left. We asked the other guys to look out, so that in case something happened, they could cover my retreat with fire. The legs that remained in the trench were placed in a black bag. Canvas stretchers were laid on the ground, on which they planned to lay the body. Igor stayed near the exit of the trench, and I crawled into the field laying down. I was now in Russian view. I crawled up to the body and looked at it, wondering how to conveniently try to move it. The body was badly damaged and burnt. There was almost nothing for me to take. One arm was torn off below the elbow, and there were no legs above the knees. His face seemed to be undamaged, but completely covered in blood. I took off his helmet, which was caught on his chin by one strap, and was just extra weight to carry. It would not be convenient to carry, as it was a wounded person under the armpits, because it would have increased my silhouette. And from that side of the trench, SPG fire often came, and I had no desire to be noticed. I saw that there was a rather strong-looking leather belt on his pants, and I decided to pull him. I started, and I understood immediately that this would be very difficult. The man turned out to be quite heavy. Between us and the entrance to the trench were all kinds of bushes, branches, and a large stone. This made it even more difficult. Over a period of time, I somehow managed to crawl almost to the entrance. But in front of me was a small parapet that did not want to give way if I did not try to pull hard. I tried to change tactics a little. By now, my gloves were covered with blood and some slime. I had to think of something else. Igor came and climbed up to me. Only then, the two of us were able to drag the body over the parapet. After overcoming this elevation, it suddenly became easier for us, and by inertia, we fell back together into the trench, and the deceased fell from the top of the parapet with his face on my shoes and covered them with blood. I immediately began to feel nauseous. I withdrew to another part of the trench. I drank some water, rested a little, and took a deep breath and returned to finish the job. Near the exit, the trench was very narrow, and both of us pulling together was not possible. So I again pulled the body alone. Here, it was possible to pull him standing up, and it was a little easier. The body was laying face down, and his whole arm was bent behind the back and formed a convenient lever. The only thing that stood in the way was a jacket tangled in the branches. The deceased was wearing the jacket, but it had already slipped off of him when he slid into the trench. But the jacket was still holding on to something somewhere on the deceased's arm. After examining, I saw that the tendons from the arm had fused to the jacket, and there was no way to tear them off, and the jacket prevented them from being pulled further. I decided to break this connection with an infantry shovel. I made about three strokes, during which the last one some gore flew into my face and eye. It was very disgusting, and I decided to try to free the coat from the branches. While I was trying to untangle it, I saw that the severed part of a hand was lying in the sleeve of the jacket. We pulled, and at last I heard a crunch. The tendon broke, and Igor and I began to lift the body and put it on the stretcher. At one point, I felt a dull prick in my thigh. I lowered my eyes, and saw that a broken edge of bone from the severed arm was resting on my leg. Fortunately, this did not pierce the fabric of my pants, and my leg remained unharmed. I don't even know what I would do if I was in such a situation. I was not told about such injuries in medical courses. I covered the deceased with a thermal blanket and decided that was enough for now. I then decided that I didn't really want to talk to anyone. I sat down near one of the firing positions where no one was, and I took off my gloves soaked in someone else's blood. I decided to throw them away. For a very long time, I sat and tried to clean my hands. 
I wiped them with alcohol wipes. I saw that there was also blood on my pants and shirt in places. I tried to wipe that off too. For a while, I just sat and looked at the split and broken treetops against the background of the blue autumn sky. It was warm, and this time of year is the time I love most, and it had finally arrived. Not just autumn, but warm, sunny autumn days, when all the greenery around is repainted in warmer shades. If it weren't for the circumstances, this weather would have brought me great pleasure. But not even this weather, or my favorite time of year, could let me escape where I was. If you found value in this story, please consider subscribing to my Patreon account. It would help me out immensely in letting me do this full-time. I would love to be a full-time war journalist, and subscribing to my Patreon account is a great way to help me do that. In addition to supporting me, you will also be given access to my Telegram account. On the private Telegram account, I have tons of uncensored pictures and videos, a lot of them pertaining to these interviews. Also, for subscribers, you can also help me conduct some of these interviews by submitting your own questions to different soldiers. If you or anyone you know is a witness or participant to combat, please consider sending me a message. I would love to get your story documented. As we always say here on the channel, every soldier has a story, and every story deserves to be told. Thanks for watching.